it's like you get together with friends and they tell you about their life and that you get that train wreck feeling. Right. There's nothing you can really do to stop it. True enough. That's sort of you want to holler and say, no, no, don't go that way. Don't go down that road. Um, yes, that's intentional. I, I have to admit as much. And those divider sections, those intercalary, short, tight scenes from um, hardcore punk shows, I think do some of that work for me. I, I, I'm sure that the reader isn't quite certain what their function is, at least for a portion of the novel, but comes to realize as you as you continue on, whoa, that's that's where they are going to end up. Tell me about the two young women. Lisa and Celeste, um, tight best friends. And if I had to admit as much um, projections on my part, I never really had a best friend growing up. I was I had a lot. I was close with my sisters, and I had a lot of good friends, but I did not have my own Celeste. And so I think I wrote a character. Um, who could function in that way, you know, I, if I align myself with either of the two of them, it's Lisa for sure. Um, she is, she got, she has a messed up family and she sees this gorgeous girl, this beauty who is not just pretty, but she's smart and kind. And so she sees her as, uh, Lisa sees Celeste as her own salvation to some degree. You know, she latches on pretty, pretty tightly. But I was inspired by the myth of Cupid and Psyche. This is my very loose reinterpretation of the Greek myth, and the original is told from a handmaiden's perspective. So it's told from a servant's position of sorts, and so I also needed a reason and a means to get Lisa into that position. So. They sort of hop onto the sex bandwagon and um, as a very deliberate thing. Summer in the Midwest can be very hot and very boring, and, and uh, so I think even though they did, they did. Ab you're right, absolutely right, in that they set out on a deliberate search for boys. They they are looking for or young men. You know, they're looking for something very different. Um, I don't think that they anticipated though exactly what what um, they were going to find, and that it quickly became an obsession of sorts. Certainly, I think Lisa is the leader in that portion of the novel. Um, she really coerces Celeste to go back to these. To the house where you know the artist professor lives and and his students regularly hang out um, but then I hope the I, I hope it seems as though they've gotten in over their heads somewhere or other that they lose the control of that and and something else altogether takes over you know maybe just they're blinded by their libidos but but something sort of goes awry the a, a switch is flicked, you know, it's flipped and, and, and there's not a lot of going backwards. I thought Lisa sold herself short. I do too. Because she, because she always seemed to view herself um, as the lesser. Well, she's always yeah. in a shadow or, you know, a, a, some portion of whatever hovers around Celeste. But like so many other sidekicks, in life, uh, far more interesting, the one more likely to 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 take chances and except when Celeste goes off, but that's a whole different thing. I think Celeste just drifted places, whereas she, Lisa's more likely to say, "Now I'm going to go, yeah, yeah, and and, and try something and make a make a deliberate leap," rather than Celeste always seemed really kind of rudderless. Yeah, yeah, Lisa's very purposeful from. You know, the moment she realizes it makes sense for her to be friends with Celeste, she she um, she makes a series of very conscious decisions, um, and and Psyche Celeste is very rudderless. You know, she's sort of uh, she moves where other people take her. The book is Pretty Little Dirty. I've been speaking with the novelist Amanda Boyden and Pretty Little Dirty, published by Vintage.